Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, great to see uh, each of you in your Hollywood squares uh, on this momentous day. I'm glad that you've taken a bit of time this afternoon uh, to come together. You know, <clears throat> for uh, the better part of this last year, as we all know, uh, the church has faced a number of different uh, adaptive challenges. And one of those is how, how we in the church can connect with our neighbors when um, <clears throat> the safety our, of our neighbors calls us to um, practice social distancing and other kinds of uh, safety measures. You know, how can we build relationships and connect meaningfully with our neighbors in ways that help us to witness to uh, the love of our God in this season? And that's a question that, again, all of us have wrestled with, and uh, that's the focus of our call today. Um, we're grateful to have a number of different folks on this call uh, who have been experimenting boldly and faithfully uh, with how to answer that question. And uh, um, looking around, uh, briefly introduce each of you and uh, offer a prayer. And then um, I will turn it over to Andrew to kind of facilitate our panel discussion. So we're grateful uh, to have with us today, uh, Reverend Amy Spar of Christ Foundry, United Methodist Mission, uh, Chelsea White, the Executive Director of the Dallas Bethlehem Center, Nicole Melrose of the Ubuntu Project, uh, Jana Gramone, Christ UMC in Plano, and Reverend Cake Nations um, of GLOW by uh, Open Worship, which is a ministry uh, out of First United Methodist Church in Denton. And so, again, we're, we're grateful to have these panelists with us to share out of their experience and grateful for this opportunity uh, for us to be together to listen and to learn from one another. So uh, let me uh, offer a prayer for us, and then, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Let us pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we pause in the midst of this important day in the life of our nation to give you thanks. We are grateful for uh, what turned out to be a smooth transition of power, and we're grateful uh, and look forward with hope uh, to the leadership of the incoming administration. Uh, God, uh, as much as we are hopeful about that, though, we know that um, our hope ultimately does not rest in elected leaders or political parties um, or the rising and the falling of nations, but God, it, it rests uh, on you. And we reaffirm this day our faith and our hope in you and your presence among us in the way that you continue to move in and through us to bring forth signs of your kingdom. God, we're grateful for the leadership of the people on this call and the ways that they do that in small ways and big ways every day. And God, we're eager to, to learn from them and from one another. God, we're, uh, we are, are deeply challenged in this season, but we continue to be hopeful about the, the new ways that are emerging, that we can continue to be your people, to connect with the neighbors that you call us to care for and love, and, uh, and the new ways that we can continue to give witness uh, to who you are and the way that you transform our lives and you can transform our communities and our world. So God be with us as we share today. We offer this prayer in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Andy. And um, it's good to be with all of you uh, this afternoon on this uh, especially important day in our country's history. Uh, so we have been about the work of ministry with and transitioning um, toward a real focus on how do we build relationships with, with new people, but also just building relationships in general through uh, what we you know, oftentimes term outreach ministry, mission, realizing that the whole purpose of the church is mission, is being sent out. Uh, to build relationships with new people. Um, so 
um, one of the things that would really be helpful as we get started and dive into talking about what, what do we exactly mean by relationships uh, and what are our expectations or um, that we should have and shouldn't have about that, but also how you know COVID and the pandemic of uh, anti-Black violence, the pandemic of uh, income inequality in this country uh, have affected and, and been highlighted uh, in this time, how those affect the way we go about building relationships. Um, I'd love for us to be able to, to start off by just sharing, uh, those of you who are on the panel, um, your name, uh, where you are uh, in service, and the uh, in a couple sentences, uh, the work that you've been about that was uh, in part funded by this ministry with grant program. Um, so, Amy, why don't you go off? You're the first person on my alphabetic list. <laughs> Sure. Um, so my name is Amy Spohr. I'm the lead pastor and missionary at Christ Foundry United Methodist Mission, and we're located in Northwest Dallas in the heart of the immigrant community. And we originally uh, started, launched a ministry with, uh, with help from the, um, the Center for Missional Outreach to um, reach out to the apartment complexes um, near us. We had originally started in the apartment complexes. We uh, we're able to build our own building um, um, a few years ago, and so we wanted to uh, be sure that we were still connecting and that our movement as a church was always back out uh, of our doors. And so we uh, applied for for funding to help with a program that we called Festi Kids, which um, was going to apartment complexes and providing children's uh, programming, dancing, music, um, drama skits, um, things like that, as well as at, at the end of the time, um, there was food and snacks and, and toys for the kids and things like that, um, and, and an opportunity to meet um, the families. Um, I don't know, Andrew, you want me to go into how we had to adapt it or just, just a brief introduction? That'll do for now. We'll get into that in just a few minutes. I appreciate it, Amy. Mm -hmm. You get to pick who's next. Okay. Um, how about how about cake? Hi, friends. I'm Cake Nations. Uh, I'm here in Denton, and um, I'm a spiritual director and a pastor. I'm a deacon, and uh, currently unappointed but affiliated with First United Methodist Church. Um, I left an appointment and came to serve at Open Worship which is a, a kind of a worshiping community within and beyond uh, First Methodist here. And about that time, the ministry with opportunity came to us um, as they were looking to expand uh, offerings to the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, Open is exactly what its name says and had already drawn um, an incredibly diverse um, uh, constituency of people, uh, seekers, and their families as well who had come. It had come to be known as a safe place, and so more and more people were coming there, many unchurched or many who had been harmed by the church in different ways. And um, what we uh, proposed and began is a um, self-proclaimed queer Christian creative community. And um, the language that I use and uh, the name GLOW all came from our, our folks, from our constituency. We identified a group of leader, potential leaders and we have a team of four who began um, our um, plans for gathering to share our gifts. And our uh, intention is to share our gifts and talents with each other, uh, knowing that they are innate God-given and reflections of our Im the image of God uh, created in us. And by exploring our gifts and sharing those with one another and through creative experiences of all kinds, um, we not only come to know each other, but we learn more about who we are and our belovedness. 
So we have done things. We've started with vision boarding, uh, which is collage in my in my uh, language. Uh, who who are we, and what what is our dream of what this community could be? This sacred space, and um, and beyond and immediately bonded, and beyond that, have taught each other cooking, different kinds of skills, uh, dance. Uh, we had a clothing smash up called Gay Apparel in the fall, uh, the previous year, uh, which was everything from doing creative things to fashion design to some, um, there was a lot of requ requests for adulting 101. How do you sew on a button? How do you use an iron? Um, and had a lot of community meals uh, and gatherings in homes. Um, and it's uh, also intended to move beyond that into mission outreach, which we did very quickly as well. Um, we have met in a studio space at a large visual arts center near the church downtown that was made available to us um, and uh, also in homes. So that's how we've started and that's who we've been. Thanks, Cake. Would you invite the next panelist? Um, it's Nicole. Nicole. Oh, Rose. Hi. Sorry, I was kind of bouncing in and out. I couldn't hear anything. Um, so how, to what extent would you like me to introduce Ubuntu? Because I missed a lot of that. I'm really sorry. Just briefly uh, yourself and Ubuntu and, um, and briefly what the, the grant was able to help okay. catalyze. Perfect. Okay, well, um, my name is Nicole Melrose and um, I started Ubuntu Music Project um, seven years ago in East Dallas. And so it's a program that is for underserved Hispanic children. Um, and our mission is to empower students through playing string instruments. So um, I have a music ed major and um, I have my master's degree from Perkins. And the vision of this was to not just put instruments in students' hands and in children's hands and then pat ourselves in the back and say, look, they've got instruments in our hand, their hands, we did a good job. But to teach them to play at a high level and to give them an opportunity to have a voice and a platform to protest um, lies of racism and lies of stereotypes that infiltrate their lives all day long. And so the purpose of this program was to bring them hope to create a pathway to a better life and to have options and futures that they choose for themselves. And that came out of my own story. Um, as a first generation Arab in the United States and having a father that came here and fled the civil war and playing violin in the public schools it saved my life um, because my family faced immense struggles. I had um, siblings who had uh, been pulled into the school to prison pipeline. I had had family deported. I had had um, my father incarcerated in different um, struggles that came specifically, you know, with growing up in a home that had the trauma of the poverty and these, these circumstances. And so playing the violin um, it gave me an opportunity to look beyond what was happening at the moment and to have hope forward. And so that was the purpose of Ubuntu Music Project. And so the grant um, gave us the opportunity to do, to expand our work and to do some things, some things that were really cool. One of the things that I boast about, and I'm very proud of, is that Ubuntu Music Project, 100% of our graduate program graduates have been admitted into magnet art schools. And so um, that means that their, their futures now are defined um, by the next step, which is a high school that's going to want really good players and to bring them into that space and then to have a trajectory to go on to higher education. Um, and so the grant allowed us to do a really cool side-by-side -side, um, concert that brought in professional musicians. And so the students got to play on a stage with some of Dallas's top, top string players. Um, and it was beautiful. It wasn't like little kids that played. My kids, when they play, I say this really proudly, they play. 
and they played beautifully. Um, and so shortly after that, the Dallas Morning News did a story about us, which was so awesome and uh, to be able to have that featured. Um, and as a result, it got the attention of the, this concert got the attention of fellow universities around. And so what that led us to now currently during the pandemic, because obviously shortly after we were hit by a pandemic and we couldn't do in person. And so we had a lot of challenges and which we'll talk about later on, but what we were able to do is get creative. And so we brought the University of North Texas music ed majors to come in and they have partnered in and have been giving lessons to our students online. So that is where we're at right now. And the grant has enabled us to go that far. And so I'm very grateful. Thank you, Nicole. And I think we have um, left Jana and Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, would you go ahead and go? Sure. I'm Chelsea White, the Executive Director of the Dallas Bethlehem Center. We are a um, nonprofit that serves South Dallas Fair Park, so the poorest, most violent neighborhoods in Dallas. And um, in short, we're, we consider ourselves a fabric, part of the fabric of the South Dallas community. And if you want to work um, with the people in South Dallas, that relationship is important. So we felt like it was important enough for us to um, do a few different things, but basically um, create a community liaison role to help us carry out di different initiatives to connect intentional intentionally and meaningfully with the neighborhood to make sure that we're offering um, things that they want and that we're able to listen to their needs and then long term um, so that we can work with them to create social change um, on, on a larger scale. So um, the, the ministry with grant allowed us to create that role and also to um, get training so that we could do this really well through the um, good neighboring experiment. That's great. And Gina? Um, I'm Jana Gramone. I am a social worker at Christ United Methodist Church in Plano. Um, our grant helped us to uh, pay for a certified teacher. We did an after school program at Julie Elementary School, um, and we had one on one tutoring there. Um, the, it, it, and the focus mainly was on reading and, and uh, comprehension, and that was the main focus. And as students um, bettered their skills, they would move up. Um, with different groups. Uh, it's very intentional, very intense. Um, it's been a, a great partnership. Um, I think we're going to talk about what, how we've kind of morphed in a minute, it sounds like. Um, and I think um, it was instrumental as far as building relationships with those teachers, with those administrators in that area. Um, that same certified teacher also did a program here at um, the church and it's called um, School on Sunday and that's an after church uh, tutoring program that we do with our Project Hope families as well. So um, kind of a combo deal there. Thank you, Jana. Uh -huh. So what I'd like to kind of dive into now is trying to understand, uh, wrap our heads around what we mean by relationships. So we have pivoted to a language of uh, maybe mutuality or ministry with, because we know that there are ways of relating to others uh, that are not what we want. Um, first of all, we would like a relationship with our neighbors uh, because we're the United Methodist Church. Um, you know, we work primarily with local congregations and one of the, the main, um, uh, issues that uh, occurs in a lot of our congregations throughout the last uh, 20 or 30 years is the distance between uh, the congregation that meets inside a, the walls of a uh, particular church um, and those who are in their immediate neighborhood. Uh, that may be a, a racial difference, uh, that may be socioeconomic differences, uh, all of those differences are abound. <laughs> and so churches uh, out of a uh, sense of survival sometimes know that they need to build relationships with people outside of their four walls and outside of their current constituency. Uh, but we also know that um, 
perhaps the United Methodist Church, uh, many of us find a home in this tradition because it at least attempts to have a way of, of moving in the world that is not a bait and switch uh, type of ministry or mission. So we're not going to re uh, require people to go to, uh, say, a prayer service in order to get food uh, at a ministry, just for the sake of example. Um, but going from further than that and understanding what we mean by a relationship is something that I think we need to continually be in conversation about, uh, knowing that, you know, the Christian tradition um, has oftentimes kind of used relationships to colonize others and kind of impose uh, will upon others. Um, and so I'd really like to use y'all's expertise. Y'all are um, part of what I'd like to call the, the missional brain trust, uh, because you've got time on the ground uh, doing the work that you do, and you've had to think really hard about this. Um, and so my question to you is, what qualities um, do you think should be a part of a relationship that we're talking about building uh, in your given ministry and in others? Can we just jump in? Please. Okay. Um, so I think the language uh, we use is is important, just like we're, we're using here. At Dallas Bethlehem Center, you know, we're a nonprofit and many nonprofits refer to the people they serve as clients. We don't refer to them as clients. We refer to them as neighbors and friends. And so we always have that hat on. And a couple of things about a neighborly relationship is first of all, it's mutual. Um, you know, it's, I guess back in the day when, when everyone knew their neighbors, you know, you come over and you'd ask for a cup of sugar and they'd give you a cup of sugar. And then the next day they, you know, bring you a pie with the sugar you, you uh, make. And so for us, we actually have a perfect example of that. Um, and this is a woman who we know, and every time we see her, we're asking about her, her, her grandchildren, but she comes to our food distribution program. And then, you know, she gives, like, she gave me like six loaves of amazing zucchini bread last holiday, told me to share it with my family. I did not share it with my family. I put it in my freezer and ate all of it. Um, but it's, it's a real relationship. Um, we're not pushing anything onto them. And, and I will say that, you know, pre-COVID, our, our ideas were to really formalize these things. And I don't like to say that COVID derailed our efforts. They just deformalized our efforts. And I don't really know that that's a bad thing. Um, everything has been so organic. You know, we pick up the phone and call the people we know and like, hey, how's it going? You know, how's, how's your dad doing? Anything you need? Um, and they may lift up needs that we don't normally offer, but you can say, oh, you need cleaning products? I actually know someone who has extra clean products. Let me just get that to you. Um, so, you know, I, I think approaching this through the correct lens of what is a literally a neighbor like, just keep that in mind, just like your neighbors in your home, you know, live next to you. Um, keeping that lens is, I, I don't think this works well really that in mind. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, anyone else want to go next? I can go. Um, I would like to share just like a couple of stories about the way that I've seen like organic relationships unfold in the program. Um, you know, when uh, one of the things that I really am um, proud of is that the mothers um, in the program and the Bintu Music Project organically came into leadership. Um, and one of the things, the challenges that they faced is that one, they didn't speak English and I don't speak Spanish. Um, so I would often have to have someone help interpret that. Um, to sign into a school to come and volunteer, you typically have to have an ID and certain things. So there were certain barriers that were intimidating um, just getting into the door to, to do that. So we had uh, parents that started to become more and more invested and were able to get 
obviously sign into the school, which is a very basic thing. And we had a, we had before, prior to COVID, we had a tutoring program. And the, the uh, tutoring assistant that I'd hired was uh, Spanish speaking and she developed a very close bond with the mothers there. And I had a whole closet that I had set up um, for crafts and anything that you know was there. And the mothers like slowly would come in and they'd be, they would say, we would like, today is actually the, hol the Mexican holiday for Mother's Day. And so we would like to come in and do some press. I'm like, okay, it's your closet, come in and do whatever you want. And slowly they were like coming in and taking over and just having total agency at the front line to the point where when we would have concerts, um, I would try to mess, mess with the cookie trays. And they would, they would say, no, get away from the cookie tray. You do a terrible job at cookies. And then they would decorate the cookie tray and make it look amazing. And so, um, the reason I share that is because I think that um, there is a good deal of getting out of the way um, when we are, you know, doing ministry with people and not having any idea of how it should go or be. Um, but it's like sort of like practicing a mindfulness exercise where you recognize and you you take you you take it in and you say, okay, this is happening. There are these barriers. I'm going to try to work to get these barriers out of the way and I'm going to have something available so that they can make this theirs and let's see what happens. Um, and, you know, things happened. Um, and so I'm, you know, I think that is a really uh, like important part of this work. Others? I, I, I'll jump in if I can. Um, I would echo um, everything that Chelsea and Nicole said about um, the the neighborliness, the just living life beside other people. Uh, as neighbors, we check on each other, we check in, but we also don't get up in their business and get too involved in their lives. But we look out for their needs and we collaborate and we help each other. So there's a lot of that mutuality that Chelsea mentioned. Um, and I love Nicole talking about getting out of the way. That's something we do in spiritual direction. The first time that we gathered after having many meetings to plan when the actual event of our first gathering, when many people were invited and expected, we had a lot of materials. We had a wonderful space. There have been many, many informal conversations and a lot of promotion and the leaders and I looked around each other about five minutes before we were gonna begin. And we were like, what if nobody comes? There was just this one moment of, oh my gosh, we, have, we don't know what to expect. And we didn't, it was a completely organic event. And we just trusted into that. And it, it, was, it was holy. And in a room of people that didn't know each other, and many were very fearful of even coming, um, bonds were created, um, people were affirmed, and um, there were a lot of tears of joy by the end of the evening from the sharing, um, just letting be and trusting a lot to God. Not to, not to say we don't plan and offer and have things available, but also this organic aspect that, um, and the deformalization sometimes. Um, I like that, that way of looking at it because certainly COVID has deformalized us in every way. Um, the, I think what it was been, um, what I learned in my previous appointment uh, where I was also in ministry in the world, we sought to have, uh, to draw, partners, which is what we called volunteers there, from our constituency, the people we were serving. And here with GLOW, our leadership is from, with, from among our folks that we're in ministry with. Um, i trying to think what I was gonna say about that. Allowing this sharing of gifts, just listening to people and saying, you know, what do you need on one hand? And on the other hand, what do you have to offer? What would you like? to bring, to show, to share here. And then giving the freedom and trusting that they're gonna take that and it's gonna be whatever it's going to be. Um, that inspired others and freed others to be in that vulnerable place of putting themselves out there to share as well. 
those are some of the things that have been important at GLOW. I'll jump in. Um, so when I, I, all the things that everybody's saying is, is a kind of the, exactly what I'm thinking about neighbors and, and, and just being a friend to people in need. Um, I'm gonna, what's gonna share kind of what happened organically with the teachers and our volunteers here at our church. Um, so like I was saying, we partner with a elementary school and um, so of course all that went on lockdown. Uh, then all our volunteers that are so used to being in service and um, were staying home. And so it kind of everything stopped, but they were not, most of them were not in a position to um, get out and about because they were fearful of their safety and things like that. So they were not comfortable doing the, the other things like um, serving people who are homeless or food insecurity or, or anything like that. They were really staying home. Um, so one of the things that through talking to the school and checking on the school, we, you know, we did some simple things like school supplies and, and you know, supporting them to um, allow students to get supplies at home while everybody was home. But we also recognize a real um, need and fear for the teachers. Um, they were becoming tired and worried about their own families and that those situations. So, um, and then I had this group of volunteers that were all sitting at home, capable, but afraid to get out and about. Um, and so organically what happened, we I decided, well, we need to do some kind of a teacher appreciation thing. Um, and, you know, you know, everybody's seen teacher appreciation things when, you know, you throw a bunch of stuff in a, in a little bag and then you give it to them and say, thank you. Um, but so what, what happened is that everything in the bag ended up being handmade. Um, and so the people that were stuck at home, our volunteers that were struggling with staying home, ended up sewing masks for the, for the teachers and the classrooms. Um, they made earrings for the teachers. They wrote notes for the teachers saying that they were in, and everything was, um, you know, we had it to Miss Smith and her third grade class, and then it was very intentional. Um, we received the nicest notes um, from the teachers saying how much it meant to them because they were in such a uh, difficult spot. So it was just something really organic. It was it was a gift for the people that like to make bookmarks and like to make earrings to for them to have purpose while they're sitting at home. Um, and then for the people that were receiving it. Um, so anyway, it was just a um, kind of a neat project and um, I'm sure we will be doing it again. Thanks, yeah. Um, so I guess uh, just to add to what everyone else is saying, I agree with all of the previously mentioned um, um, comments, but when I think about what it means to be a neighbor is to see my neighbors as whole people and not to see them for their need. I think a lot of time working in, in neighborhoods um, that are especially economically disadvantaged, like where we are located, um, it's easy to see just the people for what they physically need, like food or a job or things like that. Um, but in doing ministry with, you know, uh, we've really been reminded time and time again that these are, it's, there are neighbors who are whole people who also have um, marital struggles, who also um, have emotional and spiritual needs that they're looking for support and community for. Um, and, and to see what it means to do ministry with is not just to meet whatever need that we think they present with, um, but rather to get to know the person, the family, the neighborhood, uh, and where the church can really come alongside people for what they tell us um, their need is and not what we project it must be since we know their economic status. And I think that's something that is reinforced time and time again in our relationships with our neighbors at Christ Foundry. In addition to, um, I can't remember who said it now, saying um, um, that they are actually using their gifts and assets in the ministry 
with us. And so, for example, in, in our food distribution ministry, um, the people who are receiving the food, we started there to ask for volunteers. I had hoped to get about five, uh, maybe five to eight volunteers to help. And um, the first month we did it, there was over 20 and they were all people who were actually receiving the food as well. So um, I think it's important just to see our neighbors for who they are as whole people as, as we are. That's wonderful. I'm really thankful for y'all's um, perspectives that come from, you know, your concrete embeddedness uh, in the work that you do. And so I wonder, you know, what then about COVID-19, some of you have, have hinted at it and talked about some of the struggles that this last year has presented, um, but how, how have you found ways to keep these relationships and connections going um, and even add new ones in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of anti-Black violence and xenophobia? What, how have you done this or what ways have you tried and haven't worked out and uh, what ways have just kind of worked best for you? Um, for us, we, uh, of course, we haven't had as much face time as we usually like to have. Um, we do a drive up food distribution, um, but what, what little safe face time we have, we use it like crazy. And we really noticed at the beginning of the pandemic, um, people in our neighborhood seem to really be craving human interaction, just like everyone else. And we heard a, a lot of feedback about you know, coming to DBC on Thursdays, just as they always have. Um, of course, getting, you know, great food was fantastic, but it was also that sense of familiarity and normalcy that you're still seeing the same people. We're still chit-chatting with you as much as we can and, you know, joking around with you as, as much as we can. Um, so we just, we don't take any face-to-face -face time um, for granted at all. We've also, you know, because our the demand for our programming has has exploded, we've involved people from the community. So we started a hot meals program um, on Fridays, and we've hired people from the community who have the gift of cooking or kitchen skills or whatever, and maybe they're out of work or want you know some supplemental income. We just hired them. Um, in early June, when the um, anti-racism demonstrations really um, you know, kind of blew up. And of course there was tension in South Dallas. We, when we had food distribution, like the next Thursday, it was really hot and people are in their cars. So we wanted to make sure and help um, ease tensions as much, as much as possible. So we picked up the phone, um, you know, got some of our influencer friends from the neighborhood, the ones who, you know, have what we call their hood card um, to just come down, you know, just kind of walk around the cars and just, really just fellowship and, and be there and, and create just a very accessible, um, a very accessible environment. Um, we also do allow people to be human. Um, this is just a point I always wanna make. So um, we, don't, we don't need people to, to be grateful or to say thank you. I mean, if they do, that's fine. And we say you're welcome. Um, but we believe there's a standard of living under which no person should have to live regardless of anything, including their, you know, their mood that day or, or their character. Um, I just can't stress enough how real our relationships are um, with the real people we, we um, work with down in South Dallas. This isn't really related to the, our, our grant, but um, some of the other work that we did during COVID is um, we were delivering food and we paid for some hotel rooms for people who were um, discharged from the hospital and they were homeless. So we paid for their hotel for at least, so they could at least um, rehab in a hotel. And then we delivered food to, to their door. And so what we discovered um, is we already had a relationship with the city, but it just morphed into something pretty amazing. And um, we have a great relationship with them. So we are really working very, very closely um, because there is such a challenge between being homeless 
because uh, you can't it, and getting long term housing. And so you have to be either in a shelter or in a hotel. You cannot be on the street and go from the street straight to long term housing. So we helped kind of bridge that um, with um, the city by helping to pay for the, the uh, hotel room and, and, you know, offering letters up of support and that kind of thing for the housing. Um, and then also what we've done is we created a food pantry at one of the most frequented um, motels uh, where that people who are either on a, are low income and they're, you know, just, they can't get into an apartment or whatever. They can't, you know, it's cheaper to live in a motel um, than try to figure out, you know, application fees and paying for water and electricity and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the, the hotel, um, they are a motel. It's, they're amazing. The, 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 the managers are working with us um, we are looking into possibly even offering some some support kind of services there at the motel, and um, so that's kind of in the process. Um, and it's a highly transient um, people, so it'd be constantly people coming and going. So anyway, we're still working out the kinks on that, but um, just just continuing to have some food so people can have something to eat um, because there are people you know without anything. Um, so that's been a really good experience. Thanks, Jana. Others? I can tell you a little bit about uh, the changes in our ministry because of the COVID. Um, the most important thing when we began, that what we were told from the people that we were listening to was a safe space. We were told that our folks would need to meet not at the church and not in someone's home, but in a third space and that it needed to be a safe space. And we were blessed to find that and found that was true, being in the presence of others face to face. So we lost that. Um, we continued to Zoom and gather, but that was a tremendous um, obstacle for a lot of people. We have uh, unintentionally um, turned out to be a pretty young group, except for me, of course. Um, a lot of college students uh, and graduate students or, the, or that age group. And so many of them had to leave campus, had to go home. Some of them to homes or settings where they weren't affirmed or even safe. So to sit and talk on Zoom was not an option. It's just not. So um, we've moved, I'm going to say I've moved to do a lot, doing a lot more of that one-on-one -on -one contact um, that I think it was Chelsea was talking about, just checking in and um, doing some more things more informally. But we did have um, some in our group that wanted more Bible study, which was great. Uh, they want script, they wanted scripture study. And so uh, we put some of those together. And uh, it's, a, it's a particular group, but it has also attracted others in the community and others from beyond GLOW and more allies uh, and more, um, um, shall I say, more seasoned folks, um, which has been an interesting blend and um, both ways. Uh, a lot of love and affirmation and new relationships have grown out of that. We also started doing some kind of fun gatherings, some uh, also on Zoom, we've done scavenger hunts um, and some games that I have not laughed that hard in years when we had scavenger hunts. We were able to have a lot of fun and that was a different group of people. So just trying out different things for the different uh, needs and preferences. Uh, but it is, it has been a, probably the hardest thing that could have happened was to not be in person for this group. You, you really can't show and tell and teach in any of the same ways uh, on the screen. But we continue. Others. So I wonder, um, 
what wisdom, um, I know some of you don't, may not think of yourself as a wise person, but um, uh, trust me that others, others do, certainly, including myself. Uh, many have lifted up the, the mental strain and isolation faced by people uh, of all kinds throughout this uh, last year um, and the continued pandemic of anti-Black violence and white Christian nationalism most clearly demonstrated in the murder of George Floyd and the insurrection on January 6th have inflicted a terrible trauma uh, that will take a long time to begin to heal. And generally, people are feeling deeply fatigued from these extra precautions, online schooling, extra child care, loss of jobs, thinking through income and how they're gonna you know, make ends meet. Um, what would you share you know, with, with local church leaders and lay clergy um, who are attempting to try to connect with people? Uh, and just as a case in point, um, one of our, our clergy persons, you know, noted that uh, they were at the beginning of this um, last year, really trying to offer things out to people who uh, opportunities to do crafts with kids and uh, do church at home and uh, lots of different activities. And kind of suddenly word began to filter back like, hey, we love you. We appreciate it. But, you know, we are completely exhausted uh, just trying to survive here, keep the boat afloat. Um, and it's not that we're not liking what you're doing, but we just can't right now. I mean, what what would you say to folks who find themselves in that boat of um, not wanting to overdo it, <laughs> put things on people and expectations that aren't undue, but to still try and connect with people? I guess what I would offer is fairly simple and that's just ask. Um, and sometimes we need to ask ourselves what our motives are for the ministry or the action that we're taking, because sometimes in our own wanting to feel good by helping, um, we're not actually helping, right? And so I think we need to ask ourselves are we doing this so that we can say my church had X number of outreach events? Um, or, you know, is it truly that this is a need that my neighbor is expressing and we want to meet it? And I think we ask ourselves and we ask our neighbor, how can I help you? How can I be a good neighbor? What do you need? Um, something as simple as that. Can I pray for you? Can I put you on our church, you know, prayer list? Um, not in an invasive type way, but in a relational way when they share, you know, I'm going through this. Um, I think something as simple as just asking. I, I think um, Amy hit on a key point, which is like the first question is, is this the right time to be doing this, to, to be focusing on community engagement? And if so, why? and um, just stripping everything back down to basics. Um, you know, keeping in mind that people are, are whole people and everyone's in survival mode. Um, and, you know, maybe a first step, particularly if you're wanting to um, connect with the community outside your church, or I guess this would probably work within the church too, is asking people for advice or what they think. So we had, a developer come to us um, last month wanting to build affordable housing in South Dallas and they're trying to get community support um, you know, to take to uh, city council and they gave us this great presentation and I was like well we don't have an official position on this and we won't until we talk to our neighbors and see what they think about it so um, you know everyone wants to have a voice in what goes on in their neighborhood and what goes on in their lives. And I think that, you know, next week, once we start, you know, calling the people we know, um, that will go a long way in, um, you know, really uh, reiterating that this is a very neighborly relationship. We're, we're not going to speak one way or another about this developer or about this project until we hear from you guys. Like our opinion is whatever your opinion is. 
And um, so, yeah, I think just taking everything back down to basics and um, starting small and um, not, you know, trying to getting rid of any kind of quotas or, or anything like that, just focusing on creating real uh, mutual relationships and getting away from anything transactional and that sort of thing. I would love to add to that. Um, like just as like general thoughts about, you know, church and not necessarily have been too related. Um, I tend to be like a very future oriented thinker. Um, and I feel like we are um, hopefully um, seeing light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic. And um, I don't know how long it's gonna take obviously to get everybody vaccinated to get us to, into a place where we're feeling safe. We have obviously a lot of issues to deal with like the socioeconomic impact of this, this um, pandemic and multiple ways that it's impacted people, especially that are um, in brown and black communities in these spaces. So now the question is when we, when we start to get back together in, in spaces, do we go back to the old ways? of doing things, um, to the things that previously brought us comfort? Um, or is this the time now when people are a little tired that maybe it's start, time to start imagining something new and time to start imagining that there's power in our spaces together um, and that there is like the, there's power going forward. And so rather than sitting in our, in our spaces and allowing the exhaustion to take us over to, to, you know, start to look forward to the next thing. Um, that's, this is, you know, kind of how I live my life in general um, um, is always looking to the next thing. What's the next right thing. Um, so I've, you know, I've thought about creative ministry ideas lately um, and I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, it's probably not even the appropriate space to do it, but why not? We're here talking. I thought about like um, like um, churches starting to get involved in um, social entrepreneurship models that would bring socioeconomic justice post COVID to communities that need this. And I thought about, um, so I recently got offered this um, loan through Square um, where it was in-house and I just thought this could be a really cool thing for churches to do like a micro loan thing. And it was a one-time fee that you would pay. There wasn't like an ongoing interest thing. So let's say the loan was $700. The one-time fee would not be $98. And then you would, you know, only pay one time. And then monthly there would be a payment and it would only be like an 18 month thing. Okay. So I was thinking about how, you know, Chelsea, for example, in your neighborhoods, um, maybe there's a business idea that someone who is really young, they just need $1,000 to get it off the ground. And the church is going to, you know, sponsor this brown and black idea. Um, and that could spark thousands of dollars of socioeconomic justice. So um, I think that this is where we go next. Um, this is how we elevate and bring socioeconomic justice and racial justice is that we, the church needs to move out of the model of mentoring and into the model of sponsoring um, and, and moving into that space. So I am just throwing that out there, but I'm getting all kinds of messages that people are like also thinking similar thoughts, but um, I think this is where the church needs to go. I think the church needs to start thinking like a, like a business in a different way. Um, so that's all I got to say. I'm just excited about that idea and I thought I'd throw it out. We're thankful for it. Anything else about what you might recommend? Um, because I'd love for us to get into just exactly what you um, uh, mentioned, you know, once the vaccinations are really uh, moving forward and um, I know there are many unknowns about what the next year looks like, but what are you seeing as you kind of look ahead? What do um, relationship uh, building activities kind of look like? Um, 
I mean, say toward the end of the summer as vaccinations open up more toward uh, everyone, hopefully. What changes for you? I think for us, our relationship building activities stay the same. Um, we will get into, um, you know, doing some in-person discussions with our community advisory committee. We'll get back to doing focus groups. So I think the activities will um, remain the same. I have in my mind, I don't know what my board thinks, that, that part of our focus will, will change. Um, to me, it's been pretty obvious that, you know, obviously this is, this is the work that I do, that um, we've needed large scale systemic change. And with COVID and the anti-racism uh, uprising, that's become more front and center. And so I, I, I'm hoping we'll move a little bit towards advocacy using our neighbors and kind of helping them see, you know, uh, like, like when, the, when we were working on, you know, getting everyone to complete the census, it was, we were finishing that up as COVID was hitting. And so we were able to connect that and say, well, you know, I'm filling out the census means that that will affect the funding we get and so on and so forth to, to, to this um, neighborhood. But, you know, the, the bottom line for us, I say this all the time, and this is where I want us to go along with our neighbors is, you know, it used to be feed Amanda fish, it then went to teach Amanda fish. And really, we just need to change the fishing industry. We don't need to be doing either of those things. And um, through our relationships, we're hoping, you know, right now, DBC is serving as a voice for our community only because they don't yet know how to use their own voice. They don't actually need us. So I'm hoping that through our relationship building, um, we will help them find their voice and, and um, like kind of point it in the right direction, doing the right things to create actual social change that they lead down in South Dallas. I'll jump in as I'm thinking about post COVID, I'm thinking a lot about um, the way that Christ Foundry has been able to do any ministry is leveraging partnerships with other United Methodist churches, organizations, supporters, conference, etc. Um, which is really the best of our connectional system is that we are in ministry together. Um, the local churches each bringing what assets they have in order to be in mission and ministry in each of our individual contexts. And we've seen that um, uh, really come together in beautiful ways when our community was hit by the tornado and then just months later with COVID. And it seems when there's a crisis or a need, there are there is more motivation to really collaborate and bring the best of our connection and our partnerships together. And so I'm praying about what does that look like when, quote unquote, everything goes back um, or we come out of the other side of what a crisis is. How do we continue to have the same sense of urgency and passion for working together and collaborating in ministry? Or is everyone going to go back to their own corners kind of thing? And so I'm praying that um, we don't all go back to our own corners, that we can continue to bring our assets to the table and really, um, like I said, leverage the connection, which is one of the beautiful things um, that we have. Others, what does the new normal look like after COVID. So we're starting, um, we, we had a relationship with the Douglas community um, for a number of years. That's where um, our church, we call it house on the corner. We built 13 houses. We built it on the property here at the church. Then we moved it and finished it out um, in the Douglas community. Um, and so now all the, it's, it's, it's a beautiful neighborhood now. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. There um, are a lot of our families that were part of Project Hope 
slash house on the corner project but how uh, project hope is a program also at our at our church that is um more of what nicole was talking about as far as sponsorship we we um help invest in families um and people who want to go to college or get um, some a kind of training or education they set goals for themselves we help them determine what the obstacles are and how to figure out how to get over the obstacles um, and so we've had people who have graduated from high school, from college, and our teachers now today, our, our nurses, uh, accountants. Um, anyway, it's very holistic a program and it's been wonderful to see um, people because we all transform because we are so, you know, their family, you know, after you're with, with somebody for years and you see this happen. Um, and they they pray for my family and I pray for their family. So it's, it goes both ways. It's kind of a, a beautiful thing. Um, but so now the Douglas community is landlocked. There's not a lot of property over in, in, in East Plano. Um, so our model of the house on the corner that we've always done um, is not a possibility. Um, but there are a lot of houses that need to be rehabbed. There's a lot of... Um, of situations that um, we need to make right, uh, including a, a African American museum over there. So our church um, for this year, my word for the year is intentional. Um, so this year we're going to be um, every quarter doing some kind of uh, project um, and for each quarter. And so our first quarter is, is working on someone's house. So it's gonna be house by house, project by project. Um, there's an idea of doing a community garden over there. We gotta get through some hoops um, with the city, but hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, and then also working on the um, African-American museum um, is a goal as well. But um, I, think, I think key is to be intentional. And I think that's what COVID has done to me um, is that I, I, you know, we just can't let things just kind of happen as they happen anymore. We have to be very intentional about what we want to happen, when we want it to happen and make it happen, you know, kind of thing. Um, so we're working with um, the Douglas Community Vision um, nonprofit over there. And so they told us what their dreams are and we want to help support whatever that is. Thank you, Jana. Any others before we wrap up? Well, I'm uh, really thankful for y'all's presence here today and conversation together. Um, I've had the privilege of getting to kind of manage the ministry with a uh, grant program. And so I've had the, the privilege of seeing uh, your reports and the stories that have, have um, come in about the work that uh, you've been doing together uh, in your various contexts. And so uh, part of what we really hope today would be about is sharing some of these learnings and uh, and what you've uncovered so that we can um, hopefully save some of these videos uh, and be able to share those with others who are thinking about uh, ministry with ideas that they have um, in, in lots of different contexts. So I uh, hope that you'll um, be available to maybe consult with some folks that are coming down the, the pike and uh, have ideas of their own. Um, I would also say that we have, I think, going live as of the 15th, our ministry with application um, for this year. Um, we're kind of setting our budget to figure out what, how much we have to, to work with this year, and we'll, we'll talk about that um, here in the, the coming weeks. Um, but it's the same am amount of uh, funding generally between three and uh, $10,000. Uh, and this year we are going to have um, a very a particular focus on ministries that build racial equity and justice. Um, so if you know someone uh, who has those ideas or is, has a, an idea bubbling up, 
uh, please send them our way and uh, maybe help them uh, incubate that idea together. Um, and if you have an idea yourself and want to talk about um, what it might be like to uh, get another ministry with grant for a different project, uh, let's talk about it and we'll, we'll work that out. Um, I'm very thankful for your time. Uh, let's pray before we go. Oh God, on this momentous day, we give you thanks for the turning of a page, for the speaking of words of hope, of time of transition, for a pause in our collective attention. We give you thanks for uh, the transition of power here today in this country that was uh, peaceful for the most part. We pray that peace will reign and that justice will prevail. I give you thanks for all of these wonderful leaders here in our North Texas conference area who have in this last year and in so many years past and will so many years forward be about the work of embodying your beloved community. Be with them in powerful ways as they go about their work of building relationships as uh, the next year unfolds and be about uh, the work of building bridges, building relationships and having your kingdom come on earth. In your name we pray, O oh God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all and you'll note um, uh, Ruth has a statement in the chat about United Methodist, United Methodist Women uh, Units. Uh, she is a good point person for that, and we have information on our website. Thanks, y'all.